My name is Antri Snær Magnason, and uh, I'm a writer. I'm here in Reykjavik, Iceland. And uh, I have written, uh, sometimes I describe myself as a genre surfer, or uh, that is my, my career is a bit mixed up. I have poetry, plays, fiction, non-fiction, science fiction, children's literature, and uh, all sorts of things. So uh, poetry, and I'm doing a documentary film at the moment. And I should have been premiering my documentary film if the COVID uh, kind of uh, cinema ban had, would not have come up. So I've been working a lot also in uh, activism. That is a kind of social activism in, uh, uh, around uh, the conservation of the Icelandic highlands. We had a situation here in Iceland where uh, almost every river in Iceland was planned to be dammed to power energy intensive aluminum smelters. And that's where I kind of uh, left some of uh, my more kind of pure literary work and went into kind of more direct activism in, in, uh, in nonfiction and fiction. So my next book is coming out in uh, this year, actually, in the, in the UK. There is, uh, it came out just before last Christmas. And that book is called On Time and Water, or in Icelandic, Um Tíman og Vatnið. This is the cover of it. So uh, this is the Icelandic cover. So this book is, uh, in this book, I'm trying to understand what it means, or how, how do you talk about something that is bigger than language? If we take the term like ocean acidification, ocean acidification, it's the change of the pH of the oceans due to uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and, uh, and we are experiencing in the next 100 years, or forecasting a greater change in the oceans than we have seen for 50 million years. And, and, and in, uh, in numbers, I can scale things up, but, but I can't say this is enormous to the 10th degree. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do I, per how, how do I tell you that this is so big that, that it's bigger than everything in the world, that the oceans are changing so fast. 50 million years, I think the evolution of man is like 5 million years. So we're talking about a, a single human being is living a greater change of the oceans of the planet than 10 times the whole evolution of mankind. Wow. And how do you write about that? <laughs> how do you... Uh, do, do you use uh, cat blocks? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you bring this information? And then I was looking at the word, the, the word ocean acidification was first mentioned in Icelandic and also abroad about the year 2006. So that was the first thing, time this concept was mentioned in the media. So in Icelandic media, this was mentioned once 2006, once 2007, never 2008, we were busy having a crash, uh, and, uh, and then it was mentioned twice 2009. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, uh, so I'm trying to talk about climate change, but also the language at the same time. That is, uh, how do you, s because you can't just say a word. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea is that the issue is like a black hole. That is, a black hole it has so much gravity that it draws in all light that it's actually invisible. And the only way to talk about a black hole is look around it. And the idea is that a word like ocean acidification is so big and, and climate change, these are so big issues that all meaning collapses. So one of the way of talking about this issue is by not talking about it, or that is going around it. And, and some of the fundamental problems are about uh, how we conceptualize, how we understand our co cognitive uh, way of how long it takes for a new paradigm to seep in. So I'm using old paradigms and, and uh, old languages, like when the, the word freedom, liberty, equality was said for the first time in Iceland. It, it took us 100 years to understand democracy, you know, those concepts of the French Revolution. But we don't have 100 years to understand these concepts. So, um, so and then the virus, of course, is an excellent metaphor because there something new came in 
and science reacted to it and our bodies reacted to it like immediately if we got sick. So this we could understand. But if we're talking about a, a planet in ruins in, in the year 2090, it seems like the year 2090 is just irrelevant to us. So in the book, I'm uh, trying to connect ourselves to the year 2090 in a deep way. But instead of going there, I go the other direction. So I talk about my grandparents uh, and the people that are closest to me that are actually as close to me in the other direction as 2090 is in, in this direction. Glacial exploration has been part of my family myth because my uh, grandparents were, uh, they were not scientists, they were just common mountain lovers, uh, but they were uh, founding partners of the Icelandic Glacial Research Society. So uh, their honeymoon was in 1956, a, a three week journey on Europe's biggest glacier. And, uh, and it was unheard of that a woman was allowed to go on such a journey. You know, it wasn't a place for a woman to go on a three week uh, glacial expedition. But, uh, but she said, you know, wh why, why am I not as capable as anyone else? So, and my grandfather said so too. So, uh, so they went on a three week expedition with maybe 10 other people and uh, went through storms and all sorts of weathers. And uh, they were stuck in the tent for three days. And I asked my grandmother, uh, weren't you cold? Or I asked my grandparents, weren't you cold? And they said, cold. We were just married. And, uh, and I was like 11 when I asked, and I, I just did not find any rational connection of, of being warm and, and being newly married. I was just... But when they were researching these glaciers, they were, uh, timeless entities. They were like, uh, just like the clouds, you know, just like researching anything, you know, rocks or geology, you know, just huge entities. And they were timeless and endless and, uh, and symbols of infinity. But now we know that the glaciers of Iceland will vanish, many of them, within the time somebody is born today, becoming as old as my grandmother. So, uh, so that is nature leaving geological speed and entering the chains of human speed. And that is, uh, so that's why I'm using my grandmother in the story. Because I can both use her stories about glaciers. Uh, the research data that they gathered is used to, uh, to uh, foresee how the glacier will re react to global warming. And uh, I can use my grandmother myself, herself as a, as a measuring unit, like uh, of time, so I'm using kind of pancake sci-fi. That is, that is, uh, I want to have pancakes with my grandmother, and I think my daughter wants to have pancakes with her grandchild. Uh, nothing about technology, nothing about gadgets or uh, any progress of science. I just think we want to continue to be human and have pancakes with each other, and. Uh, and so I guess my, my, my daughter will have pancakes with somebody that it wants to have pancakes with somebody else in the year 2150. And we're not really enabling that future. Icelanders are, I think, uh, we're kind of twisted. That is, we're very urban. That is, we watch lots of Netflix and we, we have busy traffic and, and in a way very disconnected from nature, strangely. You know, you can have kids in Reykjavik that, you know, don't know bird species, but know lots of brands. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, there is some natural connection. I think what Iceland is connected to is, uh, we're connected to the planetary orbit because of the fluctuation of the, we don't take the sun for granted uh, because we have this big shift between light and darkness. And then uh, instead of, maybe Europe having, or, or other places having maybe vegetation being the, the fundamental entity that you notice here, it might be volcanic activity. That is, uh, that is, we have the, we have the creation of earth very actively under our feet. Mm -hmm.